Welcome to an episode of Find Your Voice, a movement led by yours truly, Aaron Dew, a guy who has overcome crippling anxiety, adversity, and difficulty like so many of you in life, whose main goal now is to help you combat your excuses, take control of your life, write your own story, and most importantly, find your voice. So now, without further ado, I welcome the host of the show himself, Mr. Aaron Dew. What's going on, people? Thank you for tuning into the show today. So this episode of Find Your Voice has really changed my perspective. And I suppose this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this show, because I believe everyone has a story. And there's some powerful stories out there that are just not being told. Now, I'm very grateful for my guest coming on the show, because although I know him through the property world, I had no idea about the other things that were going on in his life. Now, at such a young age, he has done more things than um, more things than I've done and he's done things that I suppose I wish I could have done but more importantly than that and more significant to this story and I hope you can extract this from the end of the podcast is how he's persevered through so much adversity and when I say so much adversity I mean there's a point in the podcast where I've kind of had to stop him listing the amount of stuff that he's going through for the simple fact that one it was hard to comprehend but two I I felt like the message was already there and I'm eager to get him back at a later stage so um, we can obviously explore that a little bit more but I remember and somewhere in the podcast you're going to hear this I refer to him as the UK rock (laughs) now I'm not talking about that stick of candy that you get at Blackpool Pleasure Beach I'm talking about rockers in the Dwayne Johnson because He gives me inspiration. I watch him on Instagram and it gets me to the gym in the morning. It makes me kind of eradicate my excuses. But this gentleman that I spoke to does the same because he's battling far worse than Dwayne The Rock Johnson at such a young age as well. And his story is still being written. I've managed to bring him out of his comfort zone to share his story. So um, hopefully you guys can appreciate that. And I do appreciate his time because... It's difficult sometimes sharing some of the stories and there are some points in this podcast which um, I don't ever think his family knew about as well. So um, I'm going to stop rambling and let's check out this episode. Okay, so firstly I just want to begin by welcoming Joshua to the show. So uh, how are you doing today my friend? Very good, thank you. You? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Not too bad. So uh, I just want to say thank you for taking time out of your day firstly and um, I've briefly introduced you in the introduction myself but I think it's important for the listeners to get a feel for who you really are and to hear from yourself so if you wouldn't mind if you could just explain how you basically progressed through life and uh, ended up where you are now okay so well first of all thank you for having me I've never done anything like this before so this should be fun Um, Mm -hmm. I think it's probably easiest to start where I am now it's not a particularly long journey, but it's quite a packed one. I'm 24. I'm Josh. I'm a physiotherapist, and I'm currently just hopefully going to be a property investor soon. All things being well, God willing. You will be. <laughs> um, so starting as a child, I um, I was really, really lucky. I had um, a really nice mother she, who gave me everything. She worked all hours of the day. So much so that uh, for the first few years of my life, I really saw that much of her because she was always just kind of working hard and mm-hmm. slaving away to to give me and my sisters a good life. Um, mm. I had an amazing stepdad and I had an intermittent real biological father throughout. Real is a bad word. My stepdad mm-hmm. is my real dad, but um, biological father who I saw every couple of weekends and came down to Birmingham because that's where his family are. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I got to have a little bit of my black heritage and mixed race by the way because you can't really see it by the way (laughs) biracial whatever you want to call it Mm -hmm. um played a lot of sports through being a kid through school and i um also did a an african recreation of macbeth with some really famous actors which was a really interesting experience oh wow it kind of fit with some of the things that i went to go and do in my teens Mm. so in my teens i um through school was Fairly normal, with the exception of I was fighting as a kickboxer for Great Britain. So, from kind of, wow. I went to went traveling around New Zealand with my family in year eight of school. So I was probably thirteen. Got back, started playing some football. Got given some trials for 
a local football academy near me and they were pre-season trials so I went through Google to see if I could uh, find somewhere that would keep me fit over the summer. Found mm-hmm. this place advertised as fitness kickboxing, fell in love with it very quickly and from then on I kind of never went to trials, never pursued it that much further and started fighting. I had my first fight, fortunately or unfortunately for me, it was with the current world champion from my age group and my weight and did really well Mm -hmm. managed to somehow scrape a victory off him he's now one of my really good friends actually and then from then on I kind of thought well maybe I'm not too bad at this so stuck it out eventually carried on fighting every week around the country and then ended up fighting for Great Britain which was really nice got to travel around the world then got my first proper world title in New York which was kind of cool went out there then I came home went back to school for a few days went then went back to training and Mm -hmm. then got called up to go and fight I think then my next one was I picked up in Florida Mm -hmm. then I don't know I went to fight for a European title in Rome uh broke my toe in the final because it's kind of like knockout stages to get there broke my toe in the final came a really close second then yeah, so I kind of just carried on traveling, got to see some, got to see some really, really cool places like mm-hmm. Sicily, Serbia, and then I managed to keep up my grades through school, so kept my mum happy, kept my stepdad happy, um, and then I got to about seventeen, and it mm-hmm. all started to change quite rapidly from there. Can I just stop you just for a quick second, just before we go into that? So mm-hmm. obviously you've had a very, very dull, boring life. And not really done, <laughs> not really done much. But um, there's just so many questions that it's almost like watching, a, listening to a movie. So I just want to ask you a couple of questions, just quickly. Then we'll jump straight back into where you were. Of course. So you played Macbeth. Was that sort of like, was it a school role or was it sort of oh. an external audition? Or- oh yeah, sorry. So it was kind of there was an arm to the Young Shakespeare Company that were kind of doing some diverse work, mm-hmm. and they were traveling around the country. And okay. there, was, there was some adult actors in it as well. And I just, I don't know how I came about mm. having this audition, but I ended up auditioning for this role. Mm-hmm. And then I was in a park in Salford called Houghton Park with my mum just having a picnic. And she got a phone call saying that I'd been accepted to play the role of young Macduff. Wow. Oh, right. Macduff, sorry. So it was Macbeth that was the, uh, Macbeth was the play my role was of young Mac Duff. right okay shows how much I know about Shakespeare <laughs> okay fantastic <laughs> have you done any sort of acting since then or um that was the last of my kind of theatre acting I went I wanted to go back into it and then mm-hmm. got sidetracked by football but then when I turned about 17 mm-hmm. I actually no 16 when I left school I went back into acting kind of by accident okay um and another one I've got here is kickboxing so mm-hmm I grew up as a massive, massive Van Damme fan. fan. I'm not sure if you if you know him. <laughs> I do. Oh, fantastic. I would have loved to have done kickboxing. Um, so kickbox for Great Britain. That's yes. fantastic. But then you went on to football as well. Yes. Wow. Okay. Out of the two, if you had to choose one and if you could have pursued it for the rest of your career, which one would you have gone with? Very, very, very good question. Mm. Um, I would have... Uh, kickboxing, I would say. Okay. Yeah, I'm passionate. I love football. I, mm-hmm. I'm really, really passionate about football. But kickboxing gave me a and kind of extended family around the world. Mm. And in terms of the places you've been, you mentioned Sicily. What was what would you say was the greatest place that you've seen? Oh, uh, the most interesting place I've seen was Serbia. I think. Oh wow! Why'd you say that? Because where we stayed, we got as with the Great Britain team, we got put up in a five star hotel. And this five-star hotel was kind of like a, it was built within a mall, or the mall was it built within the hotel. I don't really know which one, but it was huge. Mm-hmm. But as you looked across the road, you saw all the old war-torn houses that still had bullet holes in them and things like that. And it was a reality shock. It was one of those places where you have to get a police escort around with you from Britain. And Oh, wow. That must have been some experience. Yeah, it was. Sorry, yeah, I just had all these questions thinking... God, God, this guy's done a lot. <laughs> We're not even at 17 yet. So, yeah, sorry. If you want to continue from uh, 17, you said it went a little bit downhill. Yeah, so it didn't go straight downhill. It kind of 
seemed to peak fairly early. I was playing football and we we're playing in a league called the Northwest Youth Alliance, which is essentially the, the youth league of the semi-pro football teams around the Northwest. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of like the highest non-professional, semi-professional level you could be at below 18 if you weren't in one of those pro slash semi-pro first team mm-hmm. selections. So I was playing there and having a really, really good time, really enjoying myself. Um, I'd also signed to a modeling agency at that point for a little bit of extra money. And there was um, between shoots where, or between castings where I'd actually been cast, there was the occasional day of extra work. And Mm -hmm. one day I got a phone call saying, do you want to do a day of extra work? And I I kind of thought, well, it beats going to college. So yeah, I did a day of extra work. Had to do my college work there anyway. Just quickly jumping on that, if anyone out there listening to this says they've got no time <laughs> to do anything extra, <laughs> I, I, I just, I'm just not going to believe them because I, I don't, I don't know how you're fitting all this in. Sorry, <laughs> carry on, mate. No, no, of course. Um, so I kind of did a few more days of extra work, and then it kind of just evolved into doing a few one-line roles in different TV programs, and then I joined. And then after that, I thought maybe I should learn what I'm doing, so. Mm-hmm. I joined like a drama group that's really well known in the Northwest. Um, joined a dra- joined an acting agency and was being put forward for some really good roles. And at that time, I was also just about to hit sponsorship from one of the kind of biggest martial arts fight companies that were around at the time. Mm-hmm. So I was doing really well. Um, wow. I was playing well at football. My grades were going well at college. And then all of a sudden I got back to got back to college and I was just having a few days off from everything that I was doing just to try and recover, recuperate. And I was driving from my mum's to my nan's, which was not very far away, it's less than a mile away. And I remember getting a phone call down a one way street and I answered the phone on speakerphone and chucked it on the front seat. And it was just somebody in floods of tears and I thought, why are you calling me in floods of tears? Mm. And it was um, a phone call to say that one of my oldest ever friends had got meningitis and died in the night. He'd got it the day before and he'd uh, he died in the night. And I, um, so I kind of just stopped the car and couldn't move it. Mm. I had to put the phone down and call my mum and ask her, would she come walk for the car and drive it around to my nan's? Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of, I think that was probably the start of maybe it was a stress or something in my in my life that started. Maybe it was something that the straw that broke the camel's back from when I was carrying too much from mm. doing from acting, fighting, playing football, doing my college work. Oh, I also had a job at McDonald's, which I forgot to mention. <laughs> Just in your spare few hours. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of like in the hours where I should have probably been to sleep, I was uh mm. I was working at McDonald's for a little bit of extra money. And um yeah, so then I kind of, a few weeks after that, I was grading for my black belt because I'd missed it quite a few times. So I'd have to go and do my black belt and then a fight had come up and I'd take that instead because I thought that was probably more important. Mm. I was partway through my black belt and I got this kind of, it was just a sore throat. And my black belt was actually down near Telford somewhere. And I live in, in Bolton, which is, I don't know, two hours away or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I was, uh, and I got this sore throat and I woke up the next day and I had tonsillitis and I thought, well, nothing of it go into college and have some salt water a couple of paracetamol and see how it gets on um all the time I was kind of like trying to deal with my uh my grief so I thought well I was just, maybe it just kind of felt bad because I was in a bad headspace mm. and it was coming up to exam time and all the rest of it and I um so it never really went away so I went to the doctors got some antibiotics it cleared away for a couple of days, came back, and that process kind of repeated about, I think it was 14, 15 times I got tonsillitis in a row wow. um, between going to the doctors, getting painkillers. And on one of those occasions, I um, my at my mum's house, the floors are on different levels. It's a really old house, and my mum's on the very top floor. Hmm. My bedroom is on the middle floor. And I kind of, um, there was a point where I hadn't eaten anything for about 10 days I'd lost 11 kilos in body weight and I was just lay in my bed just sweating and in agony and I couldn't I went to take a tiny codeine tablet to to kill some of the pain 
Mm. And I think it closed what little was left of my uh, throat. Right. So I couldn't, so I kind of crawled upstairs to my mum and dad's room. And that's kind of the last thing I remember. Mm. So I got to hospital and they were, they said that you were very lucky because you were, if you'd come any later, then that kind of would have been the end of you. Oh, mm. that's what it said to my mum. I wasn't particularly awake for Of course, for that. yeah. And this was when you were, what, 17, 18? Yeah, 17, I think. Bloody on the, on okay. the brink of 18. Mm. So eventually that cleared up, um, happened again. And it was because of something called quinces, which are kind of abscesses which sit behind your tonsils and they're filled with just bacteria, which when they burst, they give you, they can give you some really serious sepsis, but mine had just burst. So I was lucky to be in the hospital mm. as mine burst. Right. So I was, I was luckier than most that get that. Then it happened again about six months later. Just cut the rest of that story short because it's quite a long story of me being ill. Is there a reason uh, why that happened or is it just literally like a bacterial infection or was it a matter of you being perhaps run down or everything because you were doing about 300 things a day? I think maybe it was being so run down mm. then being stressed because what I forgot to mention was in this other time there was a, a close friend of mine that was a female friend of mine that had mm -hmm. died too. She she had a headache and just wow. never woke up. She went to bed with a headache and it turns out that she had a brain tumour um, so, sad. so once I'd kind of recovered from the couple of rounds of quinces and my different bouts of tonsillitis, I um I had 18 months of what they call post viral fatigue syndrome, which is essentially just ME, but it's um there's kind of like I didn't have the energy to do anything for the mm -hmm. first six months. If I wanted to get from my bed to downstairs, I would have to have somebody either side of me because my legs weren't really strong enough to carry me from anywhere to anywhere yeah. hmm. and if if i if, so i could manage kind of along the landing to the toilet because i could crawl it'd hmm. take me a while so it'd be like on the first one like right set off now because if you need a wee then you don't want to get caught short so about i had about six to 12 months of not being able to kind of be left on my own for too long just because i couldn't do anything for myself really i couldn't i couldn't i struggled to lift my shoulders from the bed it felt like somebody had nailed big nails through the front of my shoulders and into sorry if I went quiet there it's because I was looking at my shoulders just remembering <laughs> nice one into the bed um then after that I kind of thought oh well kind of on the mend here now so I started to get a little bit fitter and I thought right I'll go back to football training so my team were nice enough to have me back went back to football training managed three training sessions of me doing kind of 25% of what the rest of the team were doing. Mm -hmm. And then I got home at one point and my left knee just ballooned. I don't know if anybody's ever injured their ACL but or seen one, but it's kind of like your knee just swells up, goes purple. But mm. And I thought, well, mine hasn't gone purple, so maybe it's something else. But I couldn't, it was so swollen that I couldn't fit my trousers on the next day. So I thought, oh, well, wow. I'll ice it and blah 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 arrested it never went away went to the doctors they gave me some anti-inflammatories it never went away they sent me to a consultant who did a, some keyhole surgery and never went away and then so they sent me to a rheumatology department to see what was going on they sent gave me loads of blood tests and nothing came back positive they drained the fluid couldn't figure out what it was as soon as they drained the fluid it came back every single time and during this process, it lasted about nine months of me going back and forth. All the time I felt really lethargic and just mm. not like the old me that could do mm -hmm. all of those other things. I could barely find the energy to just go to college or to just go. And, well, I got fired from my McDonald's job for mm. being too ill. Um, um, so, oh, sorry, it feels strange bringing it all back. I, uh, I can only imagine. So, yeah, from from there, kind of, then as they kind of figured out what was going on, it sort of deteriorated and it spread from my knee to my left hip. And then I couldn't really use my left leg very well a lot of the time, which they thought caused a problem in my right hip. Turns out it was just the same problem. Um, and then it moved up from my hips to joints in my back. And then it spread up through the majority of my back 
spread into my fingers, spread into my toes. And it got to a point where as I got to, uh, I kind of, I got through my A-levels, got really good grades somehow. Um, Somebody was looking over me. I got Mm. onto a physiotherapy course. As that kind of all was happening, I was just getting worse and worse and kind of more, um, I don't want to say disabled because it's not a great word, but I was mm. I wasn't able to to do the things that to do anything. Um, kind of always felt like I had the flu. My eyes were always on fire. Um, it messed with the way that my urinary function worked, and all kinds of other problems. And then it got to a point where I just completely intermittently I completely could not move. So in my second year of university, at the end of it. I um I just there was days where probably three days out of the week I was bed bound. Anyway, this is getting probably getting boring right. for everybody listening. No, so. no, it's, it's it's not. To be honest, I mean, in the intro, um, which everyone hears, and, and one of the reasons for this podcast is to basically mm-hmm. to combat people's excuses because I, I I believe that we always look and we always think the grass is greener on the other side or we've got it worse than other people. And uh, we always give ourselves some rationale or reasoning why we can't particularly do something. And mm-hmm. the whole premise behind this podcast itself is to hear people who have gone through such adversity but are still getting on with it. And just because at the end of the day, um, and there's a guy I interviewed the other day and he mentioned you've got two choices in life. You either go backwards or you go forwards. And mm-hmm. for me, it's inspiring to hear you say all this because even myself and I'm guilty of this myself is I'm known as the guy with a really poor immune system because I always catch a cold. I've got a tissue in my hand as we're speaking now and <laughs> it's the kind of person I am. I'm always known for the guy with Kleenex. Um, people laugh, mm-hmm. I should have shares with them, but I've, I've always <laughs> suffered. But at the same time, I've almost become a victim of my own story as well because I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm here telling people they shouldn't make excuses or the stories we tell ourselves basically dictate our lives. And I'm sitting here feeling mm-hmm. sorry for myself because I get cold easily and I've just listened to your story and I'm just thinking, I've got it so easy. And mm. and I'm sure I'm sure people listening to this are, th- are thinking the same because when I first saw you as well, I always recognise someone who keeps in good shape and look and looks after him. And you've got a very good mm-hmm. physique. You you look well. You look like you eat well, train well, and you've got all this going on in the background. And up until this conversation now, where I've actually asked you specifically if you wouldn't mind opening up just for the listeners, you've mm-hmm. never mentioned you've never mentioned any of these excuses. So I think it's admirable to be honest mate and uh, it's inspiring so I, I wouldn't for one second think it's boring I think thank you people should hear this and people should take inspiration from it because I'd be very shocked if somebody listening to this has had that much trauma and not to mention at the age of 17 you've also lost two of your best friends I mean mm-hmm. I, I've dealt with grief and I'm sure many of my listeners and even some of the people I've interviewed have dealt with a lot of grief and loss of family but I was what 26 27 uh, when, mm-hmm. when it happened to me I don't know if I had the emotional stability at 17 if I'd gone through what you'd gone through to manage mm. the same way. So uh, please continue. Honestly, it's it's inspiring, mate. Okay. As long as I'm not boring anybody. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all, mate. Um, basically, I, I managed to get through university with a few other challenges, which I'll, I'll touch on later. Mm-hmm. But it got to a point, it kind of, everything that I was going through reared its head kind of last year. So all, through all the... So from kind of age 17 to age 24, yeah, 24, I kind of, I was kind of plowing on Mm. just, but nothing ever felt right. Like I never felt like I had the energy to do what I was doing, but I was doing it anyway, Mm -hmm. but I never felt like I could, my my attention span dwindled massively and um, it was just hard to kind of, could never make a plan because I didn't know whether I was going to need my crutches or whether I was going to be bed bound or whether I was going to be okay to go and walk somewhere mm-hmm. or, and it I wasn't all doom and gloom within this. Cause at one point I was on really, really high dose of steroids mm-hmm. and I felt like Superman for about six weeks. <laughs> so that explains your physique then. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I'm that joking. Happened at kind of 2021 and I just managed to kind of keep it from there. I suppose I got, I got lucky there, but throughout all of this, I was kind of, despite the fact that I couldn't, so I, I explained to where it reared its head last year, um, mm. or even this year, I suppose, to a mm-hmm. certain extent. It kind of, I got to a point where I was on my crutches for two or three days a week. I was stuck in bed for two or three days a week. Then the other couple of days a week, I was kind of, I was 
I wouldn't say okay, but I was good compared mm. to the other bits. So sometimes I'd have a couple of days where I was good. Sometimes I'd have one day. Sometimes I'd have four days. I'd never really know. So I couldn't really make any particular plans. Mm. And I um, got to a point where it was creeping up my spine so much that driving to work as a, I'd always be on my crutches at work as a physiotherapist, which came with its own set of challenges. Not one, not only being the jokes of, oh, maybe you need a physio or can I help you? Mm-hmm. Um, where there's kind of like eight speed bumps between the on the route that I take to the clinic where I work and see most of my patients. Mm-hmm. And the speed bumps are only, you could easily do 30 miles an hour over them and not particularly feel it. But my back was so sore that by the end of those speed bumps, there was a, I'd have to turn left at a junction at mm-hmm. some traffic lights and I would have to pull the car over at the traffic lights wow. to get out of the car just to try and catch my breath. Cause I was so, I was so winded and I've broke, I've been kicked in the ribs and broken them several yeah. times. I've had all sorts of pain, but I was in so much pain every day going over these speed bumps. I just had to pull the car over and just gasp for air just to try and just so I could finish my journey to work. Wow. Um, all the time while this was happening, I was trying different medications which weren't helping with the pain. But one of them is a it's quite a commonly used drug in um, rheumatology. It's called methotrexate and it's in the chemotherapy family. And it, the side effects are fairly similar. You don't tend to lose your hair, but the side effects such as vomiting. And so I would take my medication on Monday and spend Tuesday and Wednesday kind of over the toilet bowl when I could get there. And um I would have to excuse myself from my patients or I'd have to just take days away from clinic or I'd just break into random sweats while I was talking to people and just almost saturate myself in sweat as a as a side effect to the medication. And I um, I had some other health problems that going on at the same time. So kind of 18 months ago, they found I had an X-ray just to track the progress of the disease through my joints mm. and they found a tumour in my hip. So for the past few years, with for the past few years, for the past few months, been under investigation for some cancer in my hip. Um, all of the medications that I'd been taking had kind of slowed my kidney function down to below twenty percent. So there was talks of me needing some specialist kidney treatment or potentially getting to the point where I'd need a kidney transplant if things didn't pick up. Um, yeah. So that's wow. kind of my health story so I'm kind of lost for words to be honest um i think more importantly just currently i wish you all the best with the, with the cancer scare hopefully it's just a scare i know cancer has affected millions of people across the world it's, it's broken through my family as well so mm-hmm. it's something that i, I don't know I, I just have a bad bad taste in my mouth when i think of cancer so i hope mm-hmm. i hope to god and um i'm not a religious man but um, i pray you know you recovery i think you've been i think you could do with a little bit of luck mate to be honest because um <laughs> you you've you've sort of collected everybody's illnesses and <laughs> how you still manage to keep smiling and still keep going and, and you're not sitting there making excuses and, and i'm actually amazed because like i said um earlier this is the first time we've spoken really in depth about about your life and stuff i mean looking from the outside it's a completely different perspective i mean nobody would think that you've you've mm. been through half of this and and i'm sure you could probably speak for another 20 minutes on yeah. some of the stuff that you're experiencing and I, i'm not trying to move past that because i think it's important but i think the lesson is here already that people should really just feel grateful for everything that we have and it's the little things mm. in life we're often chasing some sort of destination in in terms of it's going to give us happiness when we've got everything that we technically need if we just look at it in the right way to be happy mm-hmm. now i've got a lot, a lot of admiration for you mate you're young as well so you, you keep going and hopefully things will just start turning back around for you i believe that your thoughts matter as well so i'm not quite sure mm. how you are in terms of your your mindset and stuff but i do believe and I've, I've done a bit of research on it i'm not an expert that how we speak to ourselves um can dictate our physiology mm-hmm. i know for myself for example if we use the analogy that i used to be scared of dogs and if somebody mentioned mm-hmm. a dog for example my physiology would change i would almost mm. as if the dog was there and i think yeah. i think people aren't aware of sometimes their thoughts 
it might not necessarily be like a spider or a snake but sometimes we're, we're giving ourselves these fearful thoughts that are affecting our physiology so hopefully you're working on your mindset i'm, I'm sure you are i know, I know you're, you're doing pretty much everything else <laughs> so hopefully you're developing on that and if you wouldn't mind if i could just because i'm fascinated by how you keep going and mm-hmm. i'm sure listeners are probably thinking firstly how is this guy doing all this in 24 hours mm-hmm. and secondly with all these complications that you've got but if you could just explain a day in the life of, of your life now so say for instance from the moment you wake up to mm-hmm. the moment you go to sleep because i just think it's important because if there are people that out there making excuses for why they can't do stuff or they're just feeling a bit under the weather and myself mm-hmm. included in that i'm not perfect I think it would just help of course yeah so i don't have a set routine because i've never been able to have a set routine because i don't know whether i could actually make it out of bed to mm-hmm. do my day or not but i do have certain things that I do regardless of whatever condition I wake up in. And the first thing I do is I wake up and contrary to what everybody tells you is I check my phone mm-hmm. and I check my phone in fear that somebody has sent me something that would be something I couldn't get over. Maybe I've lost a, or that, that I wouldn't like to see. Maybe that I've lost a family member or something. And if that's not the case, then I go straight into believing that, I'm the luckiest man I know, which puts a smile on my face. Absolutely. And I'll put something, I'll put some nice music on. Um, usually it's a song called The Fire by um, John Legend and The Roots. Okay. Uh, it inspires me, that song. And Or it's something by Stevie Wonder or something, just something happy, something that I've heard and something that keeps me in a good place. Mm-hmm. And then if I can move, I'll get up and I'll have a dance to the song while nobody's watching. <laughs> absolutely why not cheers me up a bit and then i love that i'll attack my day um usually if i have some kind of thing planned in the morning i will be awake two and a half hours before it if possible just because if i'm if i wake up and i'm incredibly sore and Mm. stiff then sometimes i can feel a little bit better in two 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 to three hours time something like that Mm-hmm. So I just give myself that gap for just in case. But that's kind of my only daily routine, I suppose. Okay. Okay. And in terms of exercise and stuff, I mean, I think you've done enough exercise, by the way, to last a lifetime. <laughs> but, but but if we are talking about exercise, because I believe, and I always try and promote with my clients as well, that exercise <laughs> is fundamental because you can literally take some of the, the main things from that in terms of like resilience and building calluses and stuff into 100%. anything. So um, do you still, are you still able to exercise maybe two or three times a week or do you kind of knock that on the head and look look at more on how you're feeling and then assess the day as you go on? If I physically can do something, then I mm-hmm. will do it. I believe that. <laughs> rule that I have. So if it means that I have to crawl to a place to do some exercise where my b- bottom half doesn't work and my top half does, then I'll do what I can with my top half. Wow. Um, that is my only rule. So sometimes it's just my left side, which I can't stand on or can't use, or then my right side is perfectly, I'm lucky enough to, enough, I'm lucky enough to have two sides and mm. that side will work. Or if it's my right side that doesn't work, then maybe my left side is useful. So I try my new, um, actually we have a mutual friend that put up a status about fitness goals. And mm-hmm. my fitness goal for this year is to do whatever it takes to be well enough to be consistently able to go to the gym Mm-hmm. and do what I want twice a week by February the 21st, so you can hold me to that. I will do, mate. Um, <laughs> you, you've actually got me feeling guilty now because I, I did some cardio in the morning and I was planning on doing a leg session around 12 and I had a little bit of doms um, and I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. And I wish I'd recorded this earlier because, mate, you would inspire <laughs> me to get my ass to the gym because I feel bad now. <laughs> but I just love what you said there and I've just made a note of it. I'm lucky enough to have two sides. And I think... That's incredible because that's perspective. And I suppose maybe you've kind of been forced into this reality. I think a lot of people go through adversity and it makes them stronger and they do very well. On the flip Mm -hmm. side, you get people who go through adversity and they just sit there and feel sorry for themselves their whole life. You also have another set of people, I believe, on a macro level who don't really necessarily have the adversity or haven't experienced it yet. And they're kind of waiting for it. They're kind of waiting for Mm -hmm. that wake wake up call. Um, mm-hmm. And I just wish that they could get some sort of inspiration or motivation or whatever you want to call it from somebody like yourself. Because like like you mentioned previously, like with, with the death of your, your friend and 
life could just be taken away tomorrow or your capabilities. I mean, you you were an, an extremely talented athlete and all of a sudden now you're kind of very grateful just to be able to go to the gym twice. And I just find it that sometimes we think, oh, we'll, we'll leave it till tomorrow. Or we'll leave it till next year. And that's not promised. Mm-mm. It's it's a shame you don't actually, actually, I'm not trying to give you another job here, but it's a shame you don't, <laughs> you don't, you don't post more often about your life and story because I, I tell you what, you'd inspire a lot more people because I get inspired by people like, say for instance, The Rock. And I think the whole mm-hmm. world loves The Rock. He's kind of like the ultimate guy. And sometimes you feel like you can't be bothered to do something. You'll see your status and boom, you're off. But for yourself to get out there mate you are you are actually my uk rock at the minute so (laughs) (laughs) that's a new name for you so uh, keep it up but if you do get time i think the world Mm -hmm. would love to hear a little bit more about you and hopefully this episode as well um will will give give them a little bit more of an insight into into your story because it's fascinating so far mate really enjoying it and i've also got a i've just made a note i need to listen to the fire by uh, John Legend. (laughs) (laughs) so that's on my next list um i'm gonna move it over and um I'm going to move it over to fears. Um, at the minute, you seem kind of unbreakable to me. But if I was to ask you what your biggest fear is, given that you've been through so much already, uh, what mm-hmm. would that be? I thought thought long and hard about this question. And mm-hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a bit of a round the houses answer. And sure. I'm kind of scared of everything. Like, there's, oh. there's not many things in life that doesn't scare me, kind of. Walking down the street scares me to an extent, but by that same virtue, there's nothing really that scares me because everything seems to scare me an equal amount. Mm. So I'm not going to be paralyzed. If I'm not paralyzed by a paralyzing condition, I'm not going to be paralyzed by my fears, especially if I'm scared of everything and everybody. Mm. So there's not really anything that scares me other than mediocrity, I suppose. Mm. Mm. I don't particularly believe that I was put here to be mediocre and to mm. fall into the crowd and to be and just to not make a difference to anybody mm. else's life so i think not filling that purpose that i believe i've held mm. and that kind of scares me i love that wow in this conversation mate i, I feel like i just feel closer to you as a person now um mm-hmm. having you opened up and i've got a lot more <laughs> respect not that i never had any more respect anyway <laughs> that kind of come come out the wrong way but generally listening to your story and understanding what you said i've got so much admiration for you and i i sit here sometimes and i i do a lot of self-talking mm-hmm. what i always do is i always say for instance i'm working out i always give myself mm-hmm. this self-talk like i'm the baddest in on the planet for example it's kind of like a david goggins thing love it who else is working at 5 5 a.m in the morning and now all of a sudden mm-hmm. i know what i'm going to be doing in the morning i'm going to be thinking joshua's working out <laughs> he's <laughs> ill he's got about six jobs to do he's going to go to mackie's and reapply for a job because he's bored i better i better get going so um mate hats off to you honestly uh, i salute you thank you so normally at this stage i kind of jump in and ask people about adversity um <laughs> and and i <laughs> I don't even know where to start with you, mate, because I think you've had obstacle after obstacle after obstacle that you, you seem to be facing. But uh, but I'm going to ask you anyway, um, because I'm sure there's there, there's a lesson here for the listeners here that they can take away. So if you could just tell me about a time that you faced great adversity, something that you haven't maybe mentioned at the minute um, and mm-hmm. how you persevered through it. And then if you could just explain the lessons and what it's taught you, because I think someone like yourself who's given given that example it's going to mean a lot more than somebody just reading a book or reading a quote yeah so um i'm going to pick a period of a couple of months in my life where everything kind of went a little bit wrong mm-hmm. um i'm going to choose the christmas of the end of my second year at university mm-hmm. and so they'd reached a point where as i'd mentioned before i wasn't particularly fit enough to go and work um uh, as a, I would have worked as a, a waiter or something because that's what I'd done in my bits where I was fit in like my first year uni and college and um, there was a point where I wasn't fit enough to do any of that my student loan wasn't particularly covering my rent at all um, I had a bursary to train which didn't which covered me to eat and a few of my bills but I was kind of like 1,999 pounds into a 2,000 pound overdraft Mm. And it was about the Christmas and it was about Christmas time. So um, 
I was kind of, I asked my, during that time as well, I should say that my, um, my stepdad had left my mom. So um, just because they'd parted ways, which meant that I was kind of the one that was there to kind of, I was up till four in the morning with my mom or, or with my sisters who were just kind of all devastated by it. And at the same time, I had deadlines to meet, et cetera. Um, and all that time I had bills that I couldn't pay. Hmm. So it was kind of a point where I'd asked my mom for Christmas, could I have some money to buy my younger and my older sister some some Christmas presents? Because mm-hmm. otherwise they wouldn't have got anything from me and I would never have them miss out just because I'd mismanaged my money or whatever. Um, so all the time whilst this was going on, my, um, my nan on my mum's side had got a serious case of rapidly deteri- deteriorating Alzheimer's where we couldn't care for her anymore and so we had to try and find her a home and my nan was kind of the one which which brought me up as I said at the start when my mum was working Mm -hmm. so hard and my Mm -hmm. stepdad was working really hard um and my stepdad's dad had got some had got Parkinson's and so we were trying to find ways to help him so I was just trying to keep everybody afloat because I was the one that that kind of just brushes stuff off because I've brushed Mm. everything else off um Kevin Hart says he shoulder shrugs stuff. I just kind of brush it off. I don't really Mm. shrug my shoulders. But I got to a point where it kind of all got, and it just all the time, it was just, I was just kind of, I couldn't make head or tail of anything because I was, I had so much to try and figure out and everything hurt so much physically and I couldn't, and I was trying to figure out bills and I was trying to do my assignments so I didn't fail and get kept behind. I'd already been kept behind in college and I'd, definitely didn't want that feeling again so there was a point where I kind of when I'd gone back home there was a there's a good bridge in Bolton that's quite high and quite secluded Mm -hmm. and I took myself to it and was just kind of thinking about what what the consequences would be if I was just to kind of take a trip and end up at the bottom of it um but I don't know what I kind of don't know what what stopped me I think it was just the fact that I couldn't everybody was suffering so much already that I wasn't going to make them suffer anymore. Anymore. Mm. Yeah. And that was, I think that was probably like my, well, at least I thought that was my rock bottom. Mm. And then after Christmas, there was a whole host of bills, which I'd never, which I didn't even account for just because my head was spinning. Mm. So I ended up about £3,000 into my uh, £2,000 overdraft. And I couldn't, didn't want to ask anybody because everybody was already suffering with their own problems at home. So um I just kind of I think that was probably my moment of adversity out of anything else that I kind of struggled with the most Mm. and I think I got through it I found a Jim Rohn video on YouTube and watched that and that kind of made me feel a little bit better and then I read a couple of books like The Alchemist and thought actually my life doesn't have to kind of be this way so Mm. I thought well the most immediate problem that I can affect is my money problem. So I learned a couple of new skills. I learned a little bit of online marketing and luckily found a way to sell those and made my broke even. Mm -hmm. And then my student loan came in. So I had a little bit of money. um, So I could buy a couple more presents for my better half. And I didn't have to worry so much then about the bills for my rent and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of nice. And from there, I kind of thought, well, there's no real situation that's as that's as bad as that, and I've been kind of smiling ever since, to be honest. Mm. I think reflecting on everything that has been with my friends, my family, etc., it kind of that's why I think I'm the luckiest man I know, because come through it all, and I've still got the majority of my family, still got the majority of my friends, and mm. still got an amazing dog, lovely girlfriend, and. I've managed to get a really, really nice career. So, mm. yeah. I love that. I'm I'm just very glad, firstly, that uh, you didn't make the wrong move uh, that day at the bridge because I think the world and your family and your friends and even myself now getting to know you more, we would have all missed out, mate. And I, and I, and I mean that sincerely. You also touched on a very good thing there as well. I think when, you, when you've been at rock bottom, and I don't wish this on anyone who hasn't been there, but sometimes I feel that if you've been at rock bottom and you come out of it 
then everything's a blessing. Um, mm-hmm. and lo- like you said, you're the luckiest man um, that you know in the world. And I, and I suppose I see this from my mom. I see it from my nan who have who have had similar adversity to yourself. And um, mm-hmm. I used to laugh because I used to relate them to an episode of EastEnders. I, I was like, you, you've almost got <laughs> like a soap opera kind of life, like the, the adversity that we've always gone through. And just hearing, obviously, yourself, one, it proves that everyone in the world is going through something. We're all facing mm-hmm. our own battles and stuff. Yeah. But um, just to kind of take the gratitude element from it and, and move, move forward from it, and having come out of it, so even if you moved one step away, so you moved one step away from that bridge, now everything is is so much better. If if, mm-hmm. if that if that kind of makes sense, so I think um, mm. I think you've got the right perspective now, um, and I'd certainly urge you because I'm sure you've got a very very good network, knowing the person you are and the personality that mm-hmm. you, that, that you've got. Um, that if ever you do feel that things spiral out of control please do always reach out i'm sure you've got many people close to you as well that you can rely on and one thing i've realized is when i used to struggle i used to enclose a lot of stuff and that's even from like my missus at the time or Mm -hmm. my mom or my brother and it was only when i started showing vulnerability and i think for a guy vulnerability is strength and Mm -hmm. we we so often we we have this bravado that we can't cry or we mate i cry i cry all the time you Mm -hmm. know i'm not i'm not i'm not afraid to say that because by me expressing my emotions and speaking about it, it just helps me so much in terms of yeah. facing facing whatever I'm going through and basically dealing with it. So uh, I'm proud of you, mate. And I, I, I can't believe how young you are to show such an intelligence. You mentioned also something else I just took a note of, which was about the managing money and how you didn't want your sisters to be without. Mm-hmm. You, you took accountability for mismanaging your money. And up mm-hmm. until probably the age of 25 myself... I mm-hmm. had I had no sense of responsibility. So again, like your emotional intelligence is fantastic. So onwards and upwards for you, mate. I got my fingers crossed for you. <laughs> We're on the way up. The buzzer has gone off. And what I'm going to be doing now is putting you through the paces. So we're going to see how quick you can think and how quick you can answer as many questions as possible. Let's do it. There is no right or wrong. If you can't think, just say pass. And we're going to start the timer for 60 seconds in three two one okay the ability to fly or be invisible fly money or fame money netflix or youtube youtube van damme or bruce lee van damme coke or pepsi pass would you rather know how you would die or when you would die pass summer or winter (laughs) winter your favorite place in the whole wide world grasmere in the lake district speak all languages or be able to speak to animals animals if you could abolish one thing in the world, what would it be? Uh, self-doubt. Love that. Your favourite song ever? The Fire. Read minds or predict the future? Mm, predict the future. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Have you ever been in a fight? <laughs> I think we know this. <laughs> Hundreds. And did you always win? No. Favourite movie star? Amber Heard. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Comedy or horror? Comedy. Singing or dancing? Dancing. Okay, and that's time. But I'm curious. I don't know why you passed, but Coke or Pepsi, mate? I need to know. Because I don't really care for either. Ah, right, okay. You don't drink any of them? I do, but I don't care. Okay, okay. Well, I, I kind of care a little bit. It's just a personal thing. <laughs> I'm a Pepsi fan anyway, a Pepsi Max fan. So Okay. Just, we'll, we'll just pretend that you like Pepsi as well. <laughs> yeah, okay. Pepsi. Love it. Okay, brilliant. So we're kind of coming towards the end of... Um, mm-hmm the podcast so we've just got a couple of more questions that i really want to just try and get from you so um the next one's about reflection mm-hmm. hindsight's a wonderful thing and when we reflect we can often think of ways to get to where we are quicker or mm-hmm. uh, do things earlier or perhaps move us towards our goals that little bit quicker but i guess the journey also teaches us a lot as well i'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason so mm-hmm. what i want to know is if you could go back in time to one moment where you really struggled and suffered with adversity and you could whisper something in your ear. So if you use the example that you mentioned, i.e. standing at the bridge, and knowing mm-hmm. what you know now, what would you whisper to your 17-year-old or 18-year-old self, however old you were at that time? I would whisper, don't be afraid because pain and fear are your friends, mm-hmm. if that's the way you see them. Okay. I like that. Because it is how we see everything, isn't it? Yeah, pain is fuel for me now. Now, I stuck my toe the other day and found it really, really funny because pain is just <laughs> something that pain is something that motivates me to be more now. It's made me stronger, so I'm going to be strong. 
And you are, mate. You are. It, that's kind of... Um, I don't know if you follow David Goggins. I mentioned him earlier a little bit. Mm. He's somebody who I'd certainly recommend looking out for. He's got a couple of interviews um, on Impact Theory. Okay. Uh, and that guy is, is incredible because he kind of uses the whole pain and basically pushing your body to, to its limits. He's just got a new book out, actually. Um, I should be getting sponsored for this, by the way. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he's got a new book out called Can't Hurt Me. And I and I mm-hmm. listened to it. And honestly, if I'm feeling lazy for like an ounce of a second, it makes me feel like mm-hmm. shit. So um, it, kind of like <laughs> listening to you today, I feel really motivated. I feel inspired by your stories. The stuff that you've been through, it's made you the person that you are today. And you're going to help so many other people and inspire oh, people. And I think you've just got a brilliant perspective on it. And that brings us to our last question so the last question i always like to ask my guests is if in 150 years time and there was a book and somebody come across it and it was about you about joshua mm-hmm. what i want to know is actually i want to know two things so i'm just adding okay. a question in here firstly i want to know what the title of that book would be and mm-hmm. secondly i want to know what the blurb would say okay <laughs> uh well the the title of my book would be can I swear? You can say whatever you want, mate. <laughs> the title of my book would be Fuck It. Because it. <laughs> one thing I've learned is that you never really know what is going to happen. So fuck it. Whatever happens, mm. embrace it, enjoy it, whether it's painful or pleasurable or mm. whether whether it's whether it happens to you or somebody else. Enjoy it, embrace mm. it, learn from it and use it to fuel you to go further. So yeah, I'd say fuck it, because that's kind of what I say whenever anything mm-hmm. happens. I love it. And the blurb? Um, the blurb would say he enjoyed every day that he lived. Mm. His dog was his best friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it would say that he enjoyed every day that he lived, and mm-hmm. he was the most grateful man he knew. Um, he never... He had, a, he had a lot of pain and suffering, mm-hmm. but he never really suffered. Yeah, I'd say that's me. I love that ending, mate. I love it. And to be honest, you're probably one of the most grateful people I know as well. So um, it's been a privilege. Before I end, I just want people to connect with you. Hopefully that's okay with yourself. Yeah, cool. I think your story is just starting. Like I said, you're very young. Got all the years ahead of you you're going to do amazing things and i genuinely mean that whether it's in property or whatever it is who knows mm-hmm. you might be you might be in the theaters you might be in the greatest showman mm-hmm. too uh, <laughs> who knows but i think before we leave if you could just let us know um just just one place that people could reach out to you uh, maybe connect maybe have a conversation with you because I, th- I feel like there's so much more in your story and i think you'll inspire so many people maybe going through adversity and they can learn so much from you yeah, um, my I'm actually in the stages of writing a book because there's lots that I left out of this interview. So there's lots that I can share with people. And I would love it if, as the same courtesy you extended to me, if I could extend to everybody that's listening, that if they are ever suffering and feel like they're at rock bottom, mm. please contact me. And I'm going to give out my Instagram because I'm currently in the at the beginning stage of rebranding and this is the one thing that which won't be rebranded mm-hmm. it's just josh underscore asquith that's a s q u i t h i'll um put the actual links and everything in the show notes anyway just in case anyone didn't get that spelling um as for the book mate uh, if you've got a title let me know if you haven't mm-hmm. closer to the time please let me know because um i'll make a pledge now i'll be the first to purchase that i think it'd be fantastic <laughs> thank you like I, like i said earlier there's nothing boring or mundane about your story it's it's inspiring and um you, you truly inspired me i think people like the rock and all those people yeah it helps me when i go on instagram in the morning but seeing somebody who i know in real life and i spent some time with uh, mm-hmm. and i got a lot of time for it, just in the back of my mind now i can see myself in the morning just being like fuck it let's go to the gym so (laughs) (laughs) i I love it mate um i just want to thank you one more time for uh taking time out of your day no thank you please do reach out to josh and as always thanks for listening and remember this podcast is absolutely free so all we ask in return is for you to share this with a friend and drop us a five-star review over on itunes have an awesome day